The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. And by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. The Dice Tower, episode 504. Insert obligatory Friedman Freeze joke here. Welcome to The Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Richard Hamm from Rotto Runs Through is back to fill in for Tom as we discuss more of our recent plays, including Jam Sumo, the Oh My Goods expansion, Pack of Heroes, and more. I'm Richard Hamm, and here's your host, the 512 to my 863, Eric Summer. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I guess we should first explain what that means. If uh, you, you follow Freedom and Freeze's 504, which we had to make a joke about, <laughs> what, does, what does 863 mean if you were to play that in the game? Well, I have to admit, I thought we were going to be very sly and let people look it up themselves. But if you want to put <laughs> it out there, I chose for myself a combination of production, because that's a very euro topic, roads, because I want to push all my stuff around the world, and privilege, because mm-hmm. I like special powers. And 512 for me would be exploration, pick up and deliver, and race, which may, you know, equate to a game I enjoy. I uh, think, <laughs> yeah, that's a almost perfect fit. You'd think. Uh, I'm Eric Summerer. Thank you very much for joining us here on the Dice Tower today. As you've noticed, uh, Tom is still away. Uh, the way we record these episodes, Tom is not with us, and uh, Richard has graciously offered to stick around and and have a little chat with me about games we've been playing recently. Richard Hamm, welcome back to the Dice Tower. Thank you. It's great to be back. Once more under the breach, it is now 4 a.m. here in Malta, and I am <laughs> oh, ready man. to talk about games. You bet. Uh, very quickly, what's the weather like right there? Uh, it's uh, dark with uh, <laughs> yeah. darkness. Okay, so like this week, what, what sort of temps are you looking at? Oh, um, oh, probably uh, low to mid fifties. Okay. Yeah, sunny, a little brisk. It's actually unseasonably cold. Uh, Jen, my wife, was telling me earlier today, and uh, oh man, last night we had just about the most beautiful sunset uh, you can imagine. Uh, but of course, wow, that's life in paradise for you. Oh man. All right. So uh, as is our want for. Uh for this, uh, the shorter of our episodes of the Dice Tower, we, we're just going to talk about games. Um, of course, I should remind everybody that there's lots of ways to follow what we do here on the show. Uh, you can vote in our weekly top 10 lists. Uh, head to the dicetower.com or just dicetower.com. Uh, and uh, and click on top 10 list. You can vote for the upcoming lists and get included in the people's choice. Uh, you can subscribe to the Dice Tower News podcast, which gets you the latest in board gaming industry developments subscribe to our twitter at uh the dice tower or our instagram um dice tower deluxe is a youtube series in which you can hear this very program with added images and uh and additional information that you can watch while you listen and of course the flip-flop is that there's a dice tower audio feed uh in which you can get the video content that we produce at the dice tower in an audio format that you can listen to kind of like the podcast you're listening to right now. Whew. That's a whole bunch of stuff, lots of stuff to explore, but right now... But Eric, Eric, how do they find me? How do they find Rotto? How do they find Rotto? Uh, I don't have quite as long a list. You can just go to rotto.com, R-A-H-D-O.com, and you'll find me. Easy peasy. Well, that, that is easy. Richard, why don't you go first? What would you like to talk about today? Okay, we are here to talk about games, right? Sure. So, um, one that I am very, very keen on that I picked up at Essen Spiel last year is a game called Jam Sumo. Hmm. Uh, it's basically two different words, jam and sumo squished together. And Eric, I'm assuming at some point in your life you've played Crokinole. At some point, yes. Yes. I mean, I imagine a lot of players have. And, you know, Jen and I, we have played Crokinole as well, and we really liked it. But the thing is, I, I don't own a copy because I don't need that big, gigantic, I don't know, I mean, I've, uh, that centerpiece. I, I can't put it on my shelf. I know some people hang them on their walls. It mm. almost, a really beautiful crokinole board almost to me feels too classy for what is such a simple <laughs> little disc flicking game of trying to get your discs into the hole in the center and knock your opponents aside. Um, All right. Great, great game. But 
I have to admit, I am so happy I picked up a copy of Jam Sumo, which takes the idea of Crokinole, but shrinks it down to about a quarter of the size so it easily fits on my shelf. And hmm. instead of flicking discs, we're flicking dice, which is super duper cool. There's two different ways you can play. If you play in the Jam version, that's the Crokinole where there's a hole in the center and everybody's trying to flick their dice to get into the hole. Um, but the tricky thing is, once somebody triggers the end of the game, and of course, you know, people are you know, trying to hit the hole or they're trying to flick into each other to keep other people away from the hole. Once a round is over, everybody who still has dice on the table, they tally up the total value of their dice, and that becomes their score for the round. And you're gonna play through several rounds. Um, you know, the, obviously, the person who actually made it down the hole, they don't have any dice on the board, so they score a zero, and you wanna score low. So if I got all my dice down, but you've still got some dice on the board, I did much better than you. And the trick comes in, not only am I trying to get my dice down the hole, not only am I trying to keep your dice away, if I don't think I'm going to clear the board first, I'm also trying to knock my own dice around to change the, the pip values on the dice. Um, hmm. Or if I see you've got really low values, which is a good thing, I'm trying to smack your dice to knock them into higher values so that it'll hurt your score. It adds so much to what is already a beautiful, brilliant system. Crokinole is absolutely lovely, but flicking these dice, one, it's just fun. Uh, it works really nicely, um, but that extra tactical element of paying attention to score, trying to get the dice to the right side is absolutely brilliant. And if you want a different way to play, because it's two games in one, you can play sumo. You still play on the same board, which like I said, is a, is a miniature style crokinole board. But now what you're trying to do is a sumo match where I'm using my dice and I'm just trying to knock you, all of your dice off the board while keeping my dice on the board. So we're running around and now at the end of the round, once somebody's been completely knocked out and you know that triggers the end, uh, everybody who's still on the board adds up their dice and now you want high numbers. The higher the better because you're going to play several rounds. Of course, the person who got completely knocked out, they didn't get anything. But um, you know, if, if I'm left behind, I want to make sure my dice are high. So now, not only am I trying to knock you out, but I'm also trying to manipulate my own with special flicks that, you know, I, I could be, if I don't have a good shot at you at all or any of my opponents, I'll just try to do a flick just to turn my one into a six, if I can. It takes an extra level of finesse that's really, really cool. The whole game is actually handmade by a designer in England named Gavin Birnbaum. He uh, hmm. runs his own little self-publishing company called Cubico Games. And if you go check him out, basically every one of these he hand makes. And wow. they're gorgeous. They're, they're lovely wood, beautifully stained, and um, you know, they're just beautiful to behold. And it's just so much fun to pick up and play. I don't imagine why I would ever want a few of big, gigantic, cumbersome crokinole board when I got my beautiful <laughs> little jam sumo board. Wow. I mean, you, when you described this as a miniature crokinole board, I was going to ask what, what the materials were like, but this is literally a, a still a handcrafted wood crokinole style board. Does it have the trough around the outside as well? It actually, well, um, it has, no, no, no. It, it has th raised edges on the corners um, because they, they have different functions in the two different games, whether you start on the edges, actually off outside of the board or you actually start in the board. So these kind of create walls. It's particularly interesting in sumo um, because everybody's like stuck up in their own corner and you try to smash into them and there's no place for the dice. The dice can't go backwards so they go scattered sideways um, and you know, just spread all over the place. It's just a blast. Jen and I, we've enjoyed it as a two player game. We've also had people over and played it at the full four player count. And um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's everything Crokinole is, but, and then so much more in such a tight, beautiful little package. I mean, I, huh. I strongly recommend it. And, you know, if, if you pick up one of these, you're supporting an artisan, you know, somebody who is going to make it for you by hand. And that's something hmm. kind of unheard of. I know he ships all around the world. Um, if, if you're curious about this, I, I really recommend Jam Zumo. Neat. Well, let, let's back the component quality uh, down a little bit. Uh, this is basically just a deck of cards. It's called Lemonade Stand. It's a game from 2012 from Mayday Games. You are running a lemonade stand. I am and very interested in this, I have to tell you, because really? I have had this game on my shelf since 2012, and I have okay. never opened it. Tell me how it is. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, we, we picked this up at a convention. Uh, somebody I had a wrapped copy, a sealed copy, and handed it to my son. Said, hey, if you're going to play this, here you go. Uh, <laughs> and so we opened it up, gave it a whirl. You are running a lemonade stand. You have one week to earn as much money as possible. Uh, you're given some seed money, which is represented by cards. There are dollar bill cards, which can be used as special powers, like a one-time use. And then you flip it over. It's still worth a dollar, but you can no longer use it as an ability. And then there are coin cards. Uh, Nickel and dime cards can be used. They're like two-sided. So they can be used either to make lemonade as as stock for you to sell that round. Or you can flip them over and use them as advertising, which will boost the amount of customers that you will get uh, based on the weather that occurs. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, Then there's 25-cent cards, quarter cards that are just straight-up lemonade. They're just worth 10 units of lemonade. So at the beginning of each round... You're going to look at the weather forecast. There's a whole bunch of these weather cards. And you can sort of see the range of possibilities. Sunny, hazy, cloudy, rainy. And they are all different, uh, the different cards. And and they give you a possibility of what the temperature might look like, what people may be willing to pay for lemonade in the next day. Then you commit to how much of your resources you're spending. How much lemonade are you making? How much advertising are you doing? Then you flip one of the the next weather card over, and the the weather cards have an arrow on the left-hand side, which points to the previous scale. So now you saw the the range of five possibilities, and now the arrow comes out that says, oh, it was actually the number two position, which means it was hazy, and people are willing to pay 15 cents for lemonade. Oh, I forgot to say, you set your price as well after you've determined your resources. So you you will say, well, I'm going to charge 10 cents. And you will get paid the lower of the two numbers. So if you uh, are charging 10, but people are willing to pay 15, you're only going to make 10. But if you ask for 15 and the weather only determines 10, not only are you only earning 10, but you will lose some of those customers because you're overcharging. Mm. Uh, You then, you sort of figure out based on the weather, how many customers you have, how much advertising you've done. And if you have enough stock, how much money you earn. You will then take that money uh, in nickels and dimes and quarter cards, possibly even dollar cards. There's a hand limit of how much money you're allowed to have. Um, And eventually you have to start trading in for dollar cards if you get too many, more than four of each type of coin. The rules are a little vague on how and when that happens, how often you can make change. I wish they had been a little clearer about when you were able to do that because it could matter as far as your possibilities for for what you have in your hand. Um, If you're looking for a game that really teaches supply and demand and the the, uh, concept of sinking an investment into a business... This isn't a bad way to do it. It's pretty straightforward. It's random for sure because there are some weather cards that are it's raining and no one sells any lemonade this turn. And if you have heavily invested, like you could see a nice spread. You know it's going to be a nice day the next day. You're going to earn 10 or 15 cents. It's going to be sunny or hazy no matter what. And then you get the rain card, the sudden thunderstorm, and get washed out. That can be really painful. But it's a six round or a seven round game. You have one week to earn as much money as possible, um, and it wasn't bad for for being a a deck of card style game. There's a lot of moving pieces here, um, and and it it certainly teaches that investment concept of needing to spend money to make money, but don't overcommit because then you may not if things go poorly you will have nothing to build on in later rounds. Mm-hmm. I think if if you're totally out of money, if you blow all your resources and you and you get nothing, you can run to mom and get a nickel <laughs> and so that you have some resources. I I liked it. It's not fantastic. It's I don't know how often it's going to hit the table, but as an economic resource management game as an introduction to that concept, I think it works very very well. That's Lemonade Stand from Mayday Games. So, did you play it with your son? I did. I did. Uh, he he liked it. I don't think he I think he um, he managed to ride the tide of weather a little bit better than I did. Um, I thought I was being all smart and, and playing the odds and, and, you know, committing when it looked like the weather was nice. And I got hosed by that thunderstorm, whereas he would just, you know, throw out all the money he had and hope for the best. And it, it worked out just fine for him. Mm. 
So I'm curious, like I said, I've had this for a while. Um, so you, you play with your son. How would you evaluate it to play with a fellow gamer? Uh, I think it's a little less interesting. It's not a very deep game. Okay. Um, I mean, a lot of it depends on the turn of those weather cards. Um, you're playing the odds. It's almost a stock market game. Mm. Uh, so it, it's I, – I think it's a little – it's not quite as deep as I would like to play with my normal Sunday night game group. Yeah. Um, so I, I relegate this to a family game, older kids game. Okay. Cool. Thank you for answering my longstanding question. Totally you bet. I, I, hope you, I hope you get it to the table and give it a whirl. I, I, I plan to. Oh, one more question. Is there much take that in it? Uh, some of those dollar cards can... Yes. The, so some of the dollar effects, each one is unique. There's maybe 18 of them. Yeah. Uh, but some attack an opponent and say that, uh, you know, half of your lemonade goes bad. Or yeah. um, you sell at five cents instead of 10 cents or 15 cents for this round. Yeah. You have two fewer customers than you or, or others are you get to keep your lemonade for a round if you committed uh, your resources to making lemonade and you didn't sell it, you you have a, a cooler or a refrigerator for this round. So some help you and others hurt your opponents. Okay, cool. Well, uh, let's move from one card game to another. Have you played Oh My Goods? I have indeed. Okay, cool. Have you played it with the new rules or the original rules? I have not. We actually had a, a, a discussion on this. Oh, uh, that's right. I'm remembering now, yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Tom quizzed you about, and you were yes. like, I don't know. Were they new rules? I don't know. I didn't know there were new rules. Yeah, so please tell okay. me about the new rules. Well, um, first of all, I'll talk about the base game, um, and specifically to answer Tom's issues that he rose, it r brought up in his original review, which were totally valid. First of all, Oh My Goods is a very, very neat little engine building card game from designer Alexander Pfister, who is like on fire. He is one of the hottest Euro style designers working today. He's just had a string of hits. And Oh My Goods came out and the original rules were designed to be very, very light. Um, but right after it got released, its German publisher, Lookout, released new 2.0 rules that turned it from a light family, kind of fluffy game uh, with a lot of randomness into a more gamery game. Because it mm. does two things. One, at the beginning of every round, when you are at the beginning of every round normally, in either version of the rules, you get to draw two cards and add them to your hand uh, because card management is, is critical. But in the new rules, before you draw those cards, you can decide, you know what? I don't like my hand. What I've, what I've carried over from the last round is not going to get me where I need to go. You can dump your entire hand, draw a bunch of new cards, and then add the two. This hmm. gives you so much more control over the overall flow of the game, which was a valid complaint in the original version. But even more importantly, Tom's big complaint, his biggest complaint was, he could spend so much time building the engine and then never get a chance to use it. It never pays off. So mm. there's a special new rule. And I should say, all of these rules are now ratified in the expansion I'm about to talk about. The, uh, the rule is, at the end of the game, you get to run your entire production chain. Um, you know, hmm. So you could spend the entire game building for one big, gigantic, glorious production chain, or Ooh. you could focus on just doing little small builds throughout. And so it gives you a lot more flexibility and a lot more control and a lot more interesting choices to make. Now, all that aside, I, I should say... I liked, my wife and I liked Oh My Goods a lot to begin with because we played with the 2.0 rules. I think Tom would like it a lot more too. But mm -hmm. here's what I'm super excited about. The expansion for it called Revolt, Revolt in Longsdale or Longsdale in Aufruhr mm. has come out in Germany. It's going to be coming out later this year in America from Mayfair Games. That will be you know, doing a translation and all that. And right. here's what it does. It adds new buildings. It adds new concepts like uh, events that happen every round that can fundamentally change what's, gonna, what's going on. It adds characters who go into the deck. So instead of only drawing buildings and resource, you know, building slash resource cards, you can draw characters who will give you special powers. It adds hmm. a lot of really cool stuff. But more important than anything else is it adds a narrative story. It adds a campaign. Much hmm. like what you'd see in an Amerithrash game like, say, Descent. Um, 
Whoa. And it uses this narrative story to walk you through the addition of all the new game components. This is not an expansion where it just says, oh, here's the four modules, turn them on or off as you like. Instead, it says, set up the game and here, add this one little, read this card, and the card actually tells you a story. And the interesting thing is, I don't want to spoil the story. It's not an hmm. awesome story, but it's a nice little story about revolt in this city of Longsdale. And um, wow. you know, there's a cast of characters on either side of the side of the government versus the side of the, uh, the freedom fighters. And as you're playing this simple little um, kind of push your luck engine building game, you're actually involved in a big epic story that takes a full five games to make it through. And depending on what you do from game to game, it will actually be a branching story. Um, you, know, you, you might be given the opportunity, oh, you could help out the mayor or you could help out you know, these other people. And depending on which way you go, while you're playing this competitive engine building game will mean the next mission will have a completely different cast of characters and a different story. So. If to get the entire experience, you've got to play through the campaign at least two times to be able to see the branches and whatnot. And hmm. i got to say, here's the reason I'm so excited about this. Oh My Goods was a cute, sweet, little push-your-luck engine building game. But you don't expect to get an interesting narrative put into that. You, like me, Eric, are a Euro fan. And we're kind of resigned to our lot in life where, yeah, we just play economic simulations and we come up with really good strategies, but after it's done, we put it back in the box and we start over again from the, you know, from the beginning. But now, infusing story into a Euro is, in my opinion, revolutionary. And hmm. I think this is, a, this is an interesting baby step. It's, a, it's like a test case, but I can see the ideas here applied on a much bigger scale. I can imagine playing Agricola session after session after session and having a narrative that tells a story um, you know, through the gameplay. And that's what I want to see. I think Revolt in Longsdale, the expansion for Oh My Goods, is so important that every Euro designer should check it out and see how Alexander hasn't compromised the cool Euro mechanisms, but has introduced storytelling in a way that I haven't really seen before. And I want to see this spread like wildfire. In case you can't tell, wow. I'm super duper stoked about it. Uh, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's maybe one of the uh, most consequential revolutionary ideas that have come out in the last couple of years in terms of Euro style game design. And that's Oh My Goods, Revolt in Longsdale. Wow. I, I mean, what, what fascinates me here is uh, Oh My Goods is not a terribly expensive game. I, I mean, it's, it's a small box card game, basically. And so to, to have what you're, you're calling a revolutionary expansion, uh, I, I would imagine the expansion is the same price or less expensive than the base game. Yep. It basically so getting doubles both... the amount of cards that came in the original game. So don't get me wrong. It's, it's certainly modest in its scope. But to me, it's revolutionary in what it manages to do. I huh. have a gigantic wall of over 300 wonderful Euro games, and none of them tell the, a story that goes beyond, um, yeah, you know what, I made 50 victory points, and you made 62 victory points, and you won. You know, this is the just a soulless Euro, the J-A-S-E, that, you know, Tom mm. in the past has, you know, expressed... He may have mentioned that, ...indifference yes. towards. And it's the idea of breathing a narrative, breathing life into, um, you know what was already an interesting uh, simulation. It, it, to me, it's a big deal. It's a simple little expansion to a simple little game, but it signals something potentially great. Wow. Well, you certainly piqued my interest, Richard. That's uh, uh, Oh My Goods Revolt in Longsdale. There is an S in there? Uh, yes. Uh, or Actually, that's a good question. Yes, Longsdale. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know if I can summon that amount of enthusiasm, but I did have fun playing another small box card game called Pack of Heroes. Uh, this is from Adventureland Games, uh, designed by Phil Walker Harding. Um, this one, I, 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 I'm sorry to say, has been sitting on my shelf for a while, and I finally got it out. I've been waiting to play it with my son. It seemed like one that I really wanted to play with him. Uh, this is a two-player superhero battle card game. And it comes with 40 hero cards that are sort of split up into, that's, I guess, eight, eight factions of five. And you can also do a draft where you just get to choose whoever you want. But each faction uh, sort of plays a little bit differently. There's like a, a robot faction, a technological faction, a, a basic, you know, general heroes faction, an Amazonian faction, really, you know, fun groups. 
Uh, reminds me a little bit of um, Sentinels of the Multiverse in the sense that you've got these, uh, you know, unique heroes uh, that that play to certain archetypes, that sort of thing. And the art style is is a little similar as well. It's very cartoony. Um, but in Pack of Heroes, you, you each choose a faction and there is a leader as well as four... Um, you know, minion style characters. So you've got your five guys and you have a three by three grid that, that makes up the battle area. Um, and you will be drawing power cards that are in, I think it's three different colors that can trigger abilities on your hero cards. And you are trying to knock out your opponent's other characters. Pretty simple. You can either on your turn move uh, a guy that's already out on the board. And you'll start with one of your characters on the board already. You can move somebody out there, or you can bring on a new character somewhere on the board in your home row, and then you can take an action. You get to take one action. There are some rules that break that. You get to do additional actions, but you have to pay for it using these power cards, and you don't get to reshuffle your deck of power cards until you've worked all the way through your power cards. Uh, So you know that if you've used all three of your blue cards in your deck, you're not going to see them again until you cycle back through. Um, there's ways to stun your opponents and cause other status effects, and uh, they all have hit points and you take damage and, you know, all the, the standard tropes of a battle game. Um, but that limited scope, the only 3x3 three three grid, means it's, it's very tricky to hide, um, and you're, you're triggering all these abilities and trying to knock out your opponents more efficiently uh, than they're doing to you. I enjoyed it. Uh, played it a few times with different factions, and I like how they all play differently. And uh, you have to adjust your strategy based on what the strengths of your faction uh, are. Hmm. I liked it. Um, I, I don't know if it's as revolutionary as other games we may have discussed, but it is. It is a good. Um, it, it feels like one that could be explored a good bit uh, with with the several different the, the eight different factions even before you break them up and then you can start drafting your heroes and mixing and matching. There's oh. even a booklet in here that talks about the strengths and weaknesses of the different characters. Um, for a small box game, there's a lot in here uh, to to play with, and I, I think my son liked it as well. Pack of Heroes from Adventureland Games. Cool. I'm curious. How would you compare that to Summoner Wars? I mean, it sounds like maybe like kind of a more tight, intense version with just that incredibly tight grid that you're on, as opposed yes. to you know the big expansive place, but still similarish kind of card play, but just like maybe more just in your face. Um, it, it's it's certainly more distilled. Summoner Wars has the whole magic aspect where you can you know trash cards from your hand to put them in your magic pile right. to pay for things, um, to bring out there's there's no. Um, summoning cost to bring out your guys. It's simply that you're spending that action instead of moving characters that are already on the board. Um, it's, a, it's a lot more visceral and quick. Uh, this plays, it says 20 minutes on the box. Um, but yes, similar focus, but a, a much more, because it's only a 3x3 three three grid as opposed to Summoner Wars is like a 6x6 six six or something. Mm-hmm. Um, much larger field. Um, no walls like there are in Summoner Wars. Uh, but but yeah, it's that style of card game, um, just a lot how more long, limited in scope. How long does it take to play? Uh, Twenty minutes. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, maybe your first game is thirty, but it's still pretty quick. All right, sweet. If you like that sort of thing. If you like that sort of thing. Cool. All righty. Well, next up, I'm going to talk about Magic Maze, which is from publisher Sit Down. With an exclamation point. Oh, I, I'm I am sitting down. And uh, first time designer Casper Lapp, and this is a very very interesting real-time cooperative game um, where we are a uh, we players control or have shared control over a group of adventurers you know a, a dwarf and a, and a warrior and a wizard and a thief type and the situation is you know they've already gone off and had their adventures but something went terribly wrong and they lost all their stuff and now they're kind of uh, you know, back up against the wall. They need new equipment. So, as one does, they've gone to the local mall. And because they have no money, they're just going to sneak in, grab what they need, and try to get out before the mall security catches them. It's a really offbeat, 
a very humorous <laughs> fantasy scenario. It's a uh, uh, you know with with really nice, cute, cartoony art. Uh, you know, very very bright and engaging. But the gameplay is where things get interesting because. Like I said, this is a real-time game where we share control. As part of setup, there is the first tile of this mall, this magic mall, um, where all four characters are sitting. And I don't take control of the character. Instead, I have a card in front of me that says, I can move any character I want left. And I can also use portals. And that's it. That's all I can do. And you have a card that says, oh, well, I can move characters north. And Tom has a card that says, well, you know what? I can move them east, and I can use escalators. And then somebody else says, oh, well, I can move them south, and I can also investigate new doors. Or, you know, I, I can also search. And hmm. so, um, all the acts that everybody needs to do are split amongst all the players in this really kind of crazy, cattywampus kind of way. And then go. The timer starts, the game comes with a little sand timer, and we have to work together to get all our guys to run around, um, explore the maze by you know, coming to the edge of areas, exploring, laying new tiles, and trying to find the locations of what we need, the weapons we've come for. And then once all four characters have found their weapons, they all have to get to an appropriate escape. There's one for each of us. Here's the trick. While we're playing in real time, we cannot speak. So what will happen is I will, oh, I'm the guy who can move west and I can use portals. And I've got, okay, I can see that the archer, if I could move him west um, and then south and then west one more time, he'd hit the portal and I could use that to teleport him over closer to where he needs to go. So I move him west and then I'm waiting for you to move him south. And hmm. you're not doing it. Because you're <laughs> off paying attention to somebody else. Because you're the only one who can move him south. And I'm like looking at you and I'm staring at you. And you're like, what, what, what? I, but, but we can't talk. I can't say, move that guy. <laughs> All I can do is just stare at you and say, why don't you figure this out? What's wrong with you? It's so obvious. But the fact that there are four characters spread all over the place, it's just, it's amazing how this game gets into your head. And if, if you could just pause the game, It'd be so obvious. Oh well, clear. Oh yes, clearly. Of course, I need to move that guy south, so you can move him west, and then you can use the yeah. portal. That's so obvious. But it just doesn't occur to you because you're knee deep in figuring out if only Tom would move this other character north, then I could, you know, or west, then I can move him south, and that actually gets him onto the escalator. And then if Tom you know, actually the escalator, so there's these what should be fairly simple series of things we have to do, except that. The actions are split amongst all of us. And the only means of communication is there's one big gigantic wooden token. It kind of reminds me of the old jungle speed token, this big yeah. gigantic piece of wood. And Eric, if I am just, you know, there's nothing, I've looked at the board, there's nobody else I can make move west. And if you don't move this guy south, I'm, 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 I'm ruined. So I can take the big piece of wood and I can just slam it down on the table in front of you. Just over and over and over again, <laughs> trying to get your attention. But I can't point. I can just say, Eric, what you mean? And, and eventually, you're like, if, if you calm down and stop thinking about what you're thinking and think about, oh, there it is. And then you'll make that one little move. And then, boom, I can, can finish what I was trying to do. <laughs> it's insane. It's, 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 it's obviously pressure cooker. There's a lot of stuff going on. And it's interesting. The game um, introduces itself in bits and pieces because, of course, it's a high-pressure game. You want to start out fairly easy. So what I've just described is basically the beginning intro game. You can use portals. You can use escalators. And uh, people can move things up, down, left, and right. But after you've mastered that, there's level 2 and level 3 and level 4 where characters start getting special powers. Um, like the dwarf can move through certain little doors that he, only he is small enough to move through. Or the, um, the fighter can take out security cameras. Because, oh, did I mention? <laughs> uh, as you start leveling up, security cameras can start um, appearing. And if you, if you um, don't get, get those out, if, and, you know, if too many security cameras appear, we're all going to lose because they're keeping track of you. So now <laughs> we got to get the uh, fighter over to that security camera because he's the only one who can destroy it. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's an amazingly clever game. There's special powers, including probably the most valuable one in the game, the one that actually lets you pause for a second and talk. <laughs> and then, and, but then, you know, that doesn't last very long, and suddenly, boom, everything starts going again. Um, but it's, it's, it's charming, it's fast, it's funny, 
It's not really like anything else out there. And when I first heard about it, my thought was, well, I can see how that's going to be interesting in kind of almost a party situation where, I mean, you divide it amongst all the players. How many, what, what is the, I think that it has a high player count. It plays anywhere from two to, I think it's seven. Is that right? Let me, wow. no, two to, or one to eight players. You can actually play it solo as well. I don't know how that would work because then you, you, you don't have, have all the abilities. But I figured this is going to be best playing with a high player count, just a lot of crazy chaotic insanity. Not everybody can keep track. Um, if you get a high enough player count, there are people who can do the same action. And then you, you, you're like, ah, somebody move him. But <laughs> Jen and I were really surprised. Playing as a two-player game where we split all the actions between us, we were just as bamboozled and just as <laughs> struggling um, to race against time and just as often as not saying, why don't you see what I need to do here? I'm staring at you with all the power of a, of a thousand dying suns, but you just don't see what I need you to see. And meanwhile, your teammate, they're thinking the exact same thing about you. It mm. is laugh out loud funny. Um, very, very fast. Quick game you can play in like 15, 20 minutes. Just a blast. Uh, magic maze. Wow, Richard. Uh, between last week and this week, you are costing me money. I keep making. I'm, I'm taking notes as we talk, and I'm like, I got to check out this one. I got to do this one. So thanks a lot for yeah, Magic Maze. This one, I, I am. I have a high level of confidence that this will go over well in your family. I mean, it'll work great mm. with kids. But you know, it's it's a good kind of party style game that adults, you know, gamers can enjoy too if they're willing to let down their hair and just go a little zany. All right. Uh, speaking of high ticket items, uh, big ticket items, uh, next thing I want to talk about is Broken Tokens Crate for the Firefly game. Now, uh, if you've been collecting all the stuff for Firefly, you, you've realized that it doesn't all fit in the base box. At some point, you have to stop stuffing it in that one box and start carrying another box. Um, I, I have acquired the larger rollout map, and that obviously doesn't fit in the box. Uh, and, and it I think I, I had to stop putting it in after one of the big expansions. I just couldn't fit it all in the box anymore. Um, so the Broken Token, rather than making an insert for this game, they made an, its own standalone structure. It is, think of the size of the box of Firefly and maybe double that width and make it a little bit taller. It, it's This is a good-sized crate. Um, oh. And they call it the big... Dang crate, except they don't call it, they don't say dang. Um, this crate holds everything in a series of interlocking uh, containers. There's uh, some sealed containers that hold all the chits, all the small tokens that have clear plastic covers that go over them. And there's two of them, so they can go on either end of the table because this is a very large game. Um, the roll-up map that you can buy as a as an aftermarket item does fit. It's, there's even a little you know slot for it. Um, it holds all the miniatures in slots similar to the Blood Rage insert. If you've seen that, they're like little clips that hold the minis in. So if you've painted them, it keeps them separate. Uh, it also has card racks. So Firefly has lots of decks, mm. um, <clears throat> and you you have to not only draw from the decks, you have to be able to access the discard piles to those decks. And as the expansions have come out, you need more and more table space to hold all of these cards. So the the insert here, the, the crate, has these racks that hold not only the draw deck, but also the discard pile for each of the location decks and the contact decks and the exploration decks. It's a lot of decks, but there's a lot of slots to put mm -hmm. them in. Um, this all comes together into interlocking trays and, and all fits into the one crate um, that is pretty solid. Although um, I've built not only this one, I, I built this one, but I also built the uh, pandemic crate. And the pandemic crate was a lot easier to hold together. It was much smaller in scale um, as far as needing to glue all the pieces. Because this is so big, so heavy, you need to do a lot of gluing and clamping. I, I realized that, oh. you know, my woodworking skills are not fantastic. And I, don't, I didn't have all the tools I needed, especially large clamps. You want, you know, like a good shoulder width clamp to be able to hold some of these pieces together while you're gluing them together wow. if so you're you want to really like wood shop style i'm talking th this is some significant wood shopping okay. um 
and I did I stained it first. You know, I really went all out to make this look look good. It took some significant time, um, several days, sort of, you know, a couple of hours a day working on this thing um, to put it all together. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. If you're if you are in the storage solution mire that I have been with this game, this is certainly a way to make it look very pretty, very shiny. Um, so big thumbs up, but it is not an insignificant amount of time or expense to go this route. Uh, but I, th- I think it's worth it. If you're, if you're playing Firefly uh, a lot and carting it around, my, my box was practically destroyed carrying this thing from convention to convention. Now I've got this nice solid wood crate. Big thumbs up for the Broken Tokens Firefly big dang crate. Wow. Actually, it sounds kind of like you need to post a picture of it on the Dice Tower Guild to show off your, your final work with the staining and whatnot that you did. I, I, I should indeed. I've been putting them up on my Twitter feed, but I, I haven't put it all in one place, so oh. I should do that. And by the way, I did notice the uh, clever, subtle use of shiny. In- <laughs> very nice. For, for yeah, this is very, very subtle. Us. Well done, sir. You can't take sky from me. Yes. Um, well, that's pretty neat. I'm curious, though. I, I, actually, while you were talking, I looked at a picture of it, and yeah, I mean, that's, it's impressive. Um, do you just put it on your shelf with the other games? Does it fit? Uh, uh, well, n- not right now. <laughs> um, it, it needs its own place. Um, it actually has rubber feet or, or plastic feet, foam feet, that, uh, that go on the bottom uh-huh. so that it doesn't ding up your table when you, when you uh, put it down. It needs its own shelf space. Uh, I think at this point, it it would be almost a a centerpiece of a shelf, uh, a display unit. It it doesn't really fit back on the shelf the way my shelves are configured right now, but it would fit. It's about the size of maybe an Eclipse box or okay. Star Trek Fleet Captain's box now. Mm. Um, so it, if I put it in the right place, it could fit, uh, but it almost demands its own place of honor somewhere. <laughs> Wow. Very cool. Are you going to go the extra? I mean, I remember seeing pictures a long time ago of the print and play you did for Merchant of Venus before it got its reprint. Yes. Um, are you going to go the extra mile and like recreate a, uh, you know, a facade of, you know, the actual Firefly box? You can like paste that onto it. Or are you going to go that far? Or are you, are you happy with the final look you have right now? I'm happy with the look. the the um, The outside of the crate is etched with uh, like Three Suns Transport Company. Oh, it looks like perfect. a perfect. It, cool. It's it's just fine. I wouldn't want to d- touch the exterior at all, especially since it took me so long to stain it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's fine as it is. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, I've got one more I want to talk about, and I think this is going to be particularly interesting to you because I yes. you talked about seeing a little bit of it in a previous podcast, and that mm-hmm. is the new uh, escape room simulation, Unlock. Yes, which I'm waiting very un- unpatiently for well, to release. I'll do my best not to spoil anything <laughs> okay. by uh, revealing that I, my, my wife and I, we've actually got a copy of it. It was actually, by the way, I should say, provided to me by the wonderful Efka and Elaine of No Pun Included. You can find hmm. them on YouTube. They do a phenomenal board game review show, one of my absolute favorites. And uh, yeah, they, they knew I wanted it. They had finished it. They sent it on to me. And my wife and I, as soon as we got it, we cracked it open because I've been waiting, waiting, waiting for so long. Mm-hmm to have an escape room experience in my home. Particularly because my wife, Jen, she has never done one at all. She barely even knew what escape rooms were. And uh, so I was really, really excited to try it out. Now, the game comes with three storylines. And it's interesting, if you buy it in Europe, all three storylines come in one box. If you buy it in America, you buy those three storylines completely separately. So I'm not quite sure why anybody wouldn't buy all three at once, but they are packaged separately if you want. The broadly, one is a mad scientist lair. One is kind of a, I mean, you you can tell this just from the box cover. One is kind of a a crazy uh, Looney Tunes cartoon universe. And then one is a a mysterious island uh, that you get trapped on. And here was our experience. Well, first of all, I mean, you've already ta- described the basics in that, you know, what we're doing is we, we have an hour, we, we have an app that kind of runs the simulation. It, you know, plays music for us. And um, if, if we get stuck, it will give us clues and all that, which is great. I mean, the app integration is really, really wonderful. 
Um, and what you're trying to do is you take the first card, it describes the room that everybody's in, and uh, if you look at the picture of the room, you start seeing numbered spots, like a, a number 12 on a desk, and a number 6 on a door, and a number 17 on a painting on the wall. And somebody says, I want to go check out that painting. So they dig through a deck of cards. The entire game is just a deck of cards and an app on your smartphone. You want to look at that painting, you find card 17, you take it out, you look at it, and you start looking for clues. And the whole game is just about trying to find a way to solve all the puzzles, combine the right items with other items to be able to get keys that will unlock new opportunities, that will give you special codes that you type into the app, and if you type them incorrectly, that will unlock more stuff. And it's all about just going back into this deck of cards and racing against time and trying to solve these puzzles together. The core system works beautifully. I think you said you had played one of them at a convention? Or did you just play the tutorial? Or what did you play? I played... So there's a tutorial that comes in every one of the boxes mm -hmm. uh, that's like a 10-card adventure. Then there was a promo adventure that's a print and play uh -huh. uh, called The Elite yes. uh, that you can you can get from the, the Asmodee website. Or, and they were also handing out uh, a print, you know, printed versions at uh, the Gamma Trade Show, and that's what I've played you so played far. through, which I think is about half the length of one of the full adventures that you get in the box. Interesting the full adventure is like 60 way. cards, You're I right. think? The Elite was originally made only as print and play. You have to download it, print it out yourself, or and all that. If you want, you can go to Board Game Geek's store, you know, the Board Game Geek store, and they are yep. selling it there as a professionally produced set of cards for, I think, like $5 plus shipping. If nice. You, it's worth it. Yeah, I strongly recommend it, and I'm going to be uh, doing it myself because I want more. Our experience playing the three games. First, we played the. They kind of come in order. We played the Mad Scientist one, and Jen was completely new. She had never experienced anything like it. I had done one escape room, so I had a little bit of knowledge. We got through. We got stuck occasionally. When you get stuck, the app is very good about giving you clues. It doesn't come right out and tell mm -hmm. you. It just gives you. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And you know, it tries to kind of jog your memory and make you think differently. We got through the first one um, with a bit of help, and we only got one star out of five stars. And we thought, oh, that oh. was pretty fun. Then we did the second one, which was the cartoon one. It was like basically we were in a Tex Avery cartoon running around um, and uh, you know exploring. Absolutely wonderful. We had a blast. We did really well. We got four stars, um, you know, just shy of a perfect score. And after that, we were Jen was like, oh my God, we have to go out and do real escape rooms now. This is amazing. <laughs> this is the most incredible experience I've ever had. Um, and then we did the third one. Now, I'm not going to spoil anything about the third one, other than um, I'm going to say a little bit now. The very, very first thing the third one tells you is that no matter how many people are playing this, everybody's in a separate room. And you have to imagine, oh, we're on different sides of the island and we can't communicate to each other. So Ooh. suddenly, in the first two, Jen and I had been working closely together, having a great time. But now in this third one, as a two-player game, I was off on my side of the island, she was on hers. We couldn't talk to each other. And suddenly, it just, our brains ground to a halt. Whereas hmm. before, we could bounce ideas off each other. Suddenly now, just the simplest puzzle... I mean, we, because, we, again, we're under the pressure of time, really kind right. of ground us down. And eventually, huh. um, you know, we, we kind of work through that. Of course, they're not going to keep you separated for the entire hour. Eventually, you find a way, and, and then you continue playing. But it was interesting. It was so kind of demoralizing for us, the first huh. portion where we were separated and couldn't work together, that it kind of threw us for a loop. And for the rest of the adventure, we just couldn't get into the groove. We actually huh. ended that one with zero stars. We did so poor that we had to ask for hints so many times. Um, hmm. you know, and then we'd eventually get to him and he was like, oh, okay, I get it, I see. Yeah, we should have figured that out. Um, and in the previous ones, if we'd gotten those hints and we had uh, not figured it out, we'd say, oh, that's really clever. I should have figured that out. But now we were kind of, oh, yeah, I guess we should have figured that out. And we were just kind of going through the motions. And at the end of that one, Jen said, I feel robbed now. Now I wonder if I should do an escape room in real life just in case that's what's going to happen. It was really <laughs> interesting. And I huh. tell this, um, this tale as a warning I really do think the third adventure, even the first two adventures worked great as a two-player game, just two of us working together. It yeah. almost felt like it was kind of designed for that. But when we got separated and suddenly we didn't have somebody else to talk to, for us as players, it was a real problem. And we both wished, man, I wish we were playing this one as a four-player game. Um, and then I think we would have been totally cool. 
I mm. only bring that up because, it, of course, the game proudly proclaims it's for two to six players. I do think that last adventure, you want to have three or four instead of just okay. going in with the two. Now, that was just our experience. I'm sure other people will say otherwise, but that's my story. On the whole, two amazingly fantastic experiences and one that we felt like, yeah, it just didn't click with us. So on the whole, we're really excited about it. We're going to try the print and play one, the Elite, the one that you've played. And I'll be honest, I'm still excited about the concept as a whole. The next unlock, I still want to play it. Um, I was just slightly tempered because that third adventure just threw us for a loop. And if there's one complaint I would have about the game to help resolve that is, I talked earlier about how the app will give you hints if you're stuck. You're in a room, mm -hmm. it's room number 72, and you're like, I have no idea what to do here. I know there's something in this room, I just can't figure it out. So you can type in, um, give me a hint and type in, I'm in room 72, and it'll give you a little hint. Um, yeah. Sometimes, it'll after it gives you the hint, to say, is that not good enough? I'll give you another hint. Um, and every time you get another hint, you're basically losing points off your end score. Right. And what we found was, sometimes, and again, in this last one that really kind of bait us down, hi, I'm done with hints. Could you just tell me the answer now? Because I'd like to move mm. on. We've been stuck <laughs> here for 10 minutes. If I was in a real estate room, <laughs> the attendant would actually come in and tell us, right, okay, we can see you're getting a little frustrated. Here's what you have to do. I don't right. understand why the app doesn't have a tell me what to do now. Um, yeah. It, it, and and that strikes me as a weird oversight. Um, I appreciate and I respect the fact that they don't want to spoil it. They want you to figure it out for yourself and get that sense of accomplishment. But you know what? Sometimes I just need you to tell me where to go because we are not having yeah. fun anymore. I fear that my son would use that too readily. You know, <laughs> if that option was there, because you know, the, we've done some other home escape rooms and there are hints available. And as soon as they're available, he will immediately look at them. Whether we're making progress on puzzles or not, whether we're stuck at that moment or not, he will just immediately give me the clue. It's available now. I want it. Um, so I, I would fear that if there was a solve this for me option, yeah. um, that he would use it. And, and that would spoil some of that accomplishment. Oh, but I, I hear what you're saying as well. It's You'd love to have the tool available if you really need it. Yeah, because there were a couple of times that we really felt, you know, and when we eventually got it, we're like, <sighs> okay, all right. <laughs> um, would have really been much happier to get out of here eight minutes ago. Um, yeah. We don't even care about the time anymore. We just want to finish this thing now. Again, in a real escape room, there would be a human who could read the room. Uh, right. you know, in the last podcast, yeah. we talked a little bit about AI and its future um, uses in games. I'd love that app to have a little bit more AI and kind of realize when, okay, we, we've had enough. We're ready to move on to the next room, please. So speaking of uh, racing against the clock, my last game to talk about is a classic, Um Reifenbreite. Have you played this one, Richard? No, I haven't, although I feel like I have after hearing Tom talk about it for, what, a decade now? It, it, yes. Well, this is the Spiel des Jahres winner, if I'm not mistaken, uh, about bicycle racing. You have you are leading a team of four cyclists, and and you lay out your course. You can have a short race, medium sized race, long race that uh, will work its way through various terrain. Um, you you have some uphill sections, some downhill sections, also some cobblestone sections. Um, basically, this is a roll and move game. Um, you will roll two dice uh, each time one of your guys gets to move, and you will move that number of spaces. Pretty simple. But the uphill sections reduce your die roll by a certain amount. So you may have to subtract three from your die roll uh, to the point where if you don't roll high enough, you may fall over, which causes you to um, get off the track and, and have to start from nothing when you, you uh, get back going again. Um, there's also downhill sections, which add to your roll. That's great. And the cobblestone sections remove a little bit. You also have cards, and I mentioned you've got four different racers. You have cards that are assigned to each of those racers. Uh, there's also a couple of wild cards. And so you may spend one or two of those cards to replace your die rolls. So I could play a number five card and roll one die and add that to my five. So I know I'm getting a, at least a, a good amount of movement out of my move. Um you also, and in the cobblestones, you can only play one of those cards instead of two. You also may draft, rather than your regular movement, if the person in front of you, and if you were directly behind somebody, if they get a really nice move, a great die roll, and you can 
follow them and move directly behind them again, you may do that instead of your normal roll, which is great because you've saved your cards and you don't have to roll. You, you know you're moving forward. Uh, if you are in the front of the pack and you don't want anyone to do that, you can spend one of your cards as, as one of your movements and break away so that no one can follow you that turn. If you can get your racers following each other around, that can be a very efficient way to move around the board and not spending too many cards, which is pretty cool. You, you maneuver around, you're jockeying for position, you're trying to avoid your opponents drafting behind you, uh, and then you will get points as you cross the finish line and you total up your score for your entire team. There's also, if you're doing a long enough race, there's a variance where you get bonuses for getting the yellow jersey, for reaching a checkpoint first, um, and for then maintaining that first place position from one checkpoint to the next. All of this adds up into a score at the end of the game. So even if you come in first with one of your guys, if the other three are not making across the finish line very quickly, you're not going to win. You want to get as many of your guys in the highest positions possible. Total it up, see who wins. Um, it's a good time. For, for being however old this game is, it, it still plays well. It's, it's a roll and move. Crazy stuff can happen. There's road hazards. If you roll a seven, you draw a sort of a basically a chance card, which may cause a mass fall, which may cause you to surge ahead. You know, crazy stuff is going to happen, but it's a good time, and uh, I think it still holds up. Um Reifenbreite, the bicycle racing game. You're right. I just looked it up. This was published in 1979. Correct. Originally. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here's the question. I, you know, okay, so as far as I know, Um Reifenbreite has kind of been the de facto go-to board game bicycling simulation for, I guess, several decades now. Yeah. But today, we've got the new hotness of Flamme Rouge. We do. Have you played Flamme Rouge? I have, indeed. Uh, you only have and? two bicycle racers in Flamme Rouge, so it's a little more limited in scope. Um, sure. You, uh, you'd also, you do still have the uphill, downhill sections. You, you sort of create your route in Flamme Rouge. Um, it has... You have all of your cards available to you in Um Reifenbreite. Um, rather than in Flamme Rouge where you have a deck that you're drawing four cards at a time and then using one of them and putting the rest under your deck. And there's a little more cycling, cycling for a bicycling, um, <laughs> nice. in, of your decks in uh, Flamme Rouge. I, I think mm -hmm. I prefer Um Reifenbreite. I think I like, I, I like managing my team of four and having that board position a little more clearly defined, um, a little more uh, jockeying in clusters of characters. I like the illustrations a little bit better. Uh, not that I don't like Flamme Rouge. It, it's a, a very nice game. I, I like the deck management, the hand management aspect of that. Um, but Um Reifenbreite, I think, is a little more straightforward. Um, okay. And more more like a classic board game. Uh I think it's a, it's a slight edge, but it's an edge for Um Reifenbreite for me. Cool. Hey, sorry to put you on the spot there, but no, I think no, people no. would want to know. And knowing is half the battle. Yes. <laughs> and that's a whole bunch of games to, uh, to process, and I now have a whole list of things I need to go pick up in my next Cool Stuff order. Um, Richard, thank you. My work uh, here is done. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for staying up late with us. Uh, I, I hope you, you get some sleep, and uh, I certainly appreciate it. Yeah, um, it, I, again, I had a wonderful time. It's almost 5 a.m. now, and just in case, I don't expect this will happen, my wife, who's asleep in the other room, just in case she ever listens to this episode, Honey Pie, I love you. Thank you very much for 26 wonderful years. It's our 26th wedding anniversary today. Congratulations, and sir. Oh, my goodness. to start that day than by hanging out with Eric Summer for a few hours. Oh, well, now, now I, I thank you even more for spending some time with us and, and staying up so late into the morning. Uh, thank you, Richard, very much. So one more time, where can people find you when they're looking for the best of Rado? Uh, well, basically, you can go to my YouTube channel directly, which is rado.com. I also have a guild on Board Game Geek that's pretty active. You can find that at guild.rado.com. And I have my own podcast, Rado Talks Through, which you can find at podcast.rado.com. 
I really kind of cornered the market on the whole Rado.com thing. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so check me out if you're interested. I do tend to blather. You may have noticed that in this. I was trying really, really hard to be polite and not interrupt Eric. Uh, I can be a bit of a steamroller and I talk first and think later. But uh, yeah, it's a good time and check me out. Thank you once again, Richard. And thank you for listening. Uh, we should see Tom next week. But until then, I'm Eric Summerer. That's you. Oh, hi. And uh, I'm Richard Rodoham. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 504, was recorded on April 20th, 2017. Coming up next week, join Tom, me, and a new special guest for our top 10 trick-taking games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me, with assistance from Itai Perez, Derek Porter, and Rob Siri. Our slightly delayed English tea is provided by 504. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower network, including Four Corners of the Board, Boards and Swords, Flip the Table, On Board Games, The Long View, The Party Game Cast, featuring the Party Game Cast, Board Games Insider, and Board Game Blender. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. I'm just so used to listening to the show. It's just freaking me out. Yeah, it's hard. You know, you, you, uh, you feel like you're, you're just hanging out and not needing to participate. That's happened before. Exactly. You're not the first to do that. Yeah. And uh, the other weird thing, too, is, of course, you're talking so slow. <laughs> I always listen to the show at two, two X speed on my podcast player. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm sorry. You should have said that at the beginning. We could have talked like this the whole time. Oh, man. I'm a fool. Next time. Next time for sure.